Okay, we're almost there. Here comes Rachel so she can start your timer for you on time. Um, thanks everybody. The final speaker for this session is Matt Lebowitz. He's a postdoctoral fellow in the SEER here at Columbia and he um, graduated from here yeah, with his PhD in so the, from the Department of Psychology. So uh, we've already heard a little bit about his work and he's here to tell us more. Okay. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, okay, yeah, so um, as you've heard, my name is Matt Lebowitz. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the SEER uh, here at Columbia. Um, and the title of my talk today is Implications of Genetic Explanations for Thinking About Mental Disorders. Um, and as you'll hear, um, some of the earlier work that I'm going to talk about um, sort of combines genetic and other types of biomedical explanations, and then the more recent stuff focuses more specifically on genetic explanations for mental disorders and what effects those have. Okay, so one reason I think it's important to look at the effects of genetic explanations um, in the case of psychopathology is that in recent decades, there's really been a growing emphasis on understanding the role of genetics, um, as well as other sort of biomedical factors in mental disorders, and this is reflected in uh, funding priorities for mental health research very strongly. It's uh, beginning to be reflected in clinical care and that's expected to become the case even more so as uh, precision medicine makes its way into psychiatry. Um, and also it's taken hold in the public imagination as you can kind of see from these headlines, um, research about the genetics of mental disorders tends to get a lot of media attention. So perhaps unsurprisingly in this climate, uh, members of the public have increasingly adopted genetic explanations for mental disorders or genetic attributions. And th these data are a little bit old now, but uh, the General Social Survey, which is a nationally representative survey, uh, looked at the percentage of Americans who endorsed genetic attributions for uh, different mental disorders, uh, depression, schizophrenia, and what was at the time called alcohol dependence, now would be called alcohol use disorder. Um, and how those beliefs changed from 1996 to 2006. And you can see that um, all, in all three cases, despite these being very different disorders, um, those genetic attributions increase significantly among the American public. And since the, the more recent data here from 2006, it's possible uh, that the trend could have, if the trend has continued since then, that um, the percentages could be even higher now. So one reason I think it's important to examine the effects of genetic explanations is that they've actually been touted, the, these genetic sort of conceptualizations of mental disorders have actually been, have been put forth as a way of reducing negative attitudes about mental disorders, uh, which as I'm sure we can all agree, uh, the, these, men, these negative attitudes and stigma, stigmatization are a serious problem. Um, and there's been hope that genetic explanations could be a way of reducing those negative attitudes. And so an important question is, do they accomplish this? Uh, so in this headline, you can really see what I think of as kind of the crux of this, uh, this way of thinking. So here's proof mental illness is not someone's fault. Mental illness could be heredit hereditary. So the idea being that there's this either or. So if it's genetic or hereditary, that means it's not the person's fault. and um, so, and if it was the person's fault, that would mean it would have to be caused by something other than heredity. Uh, so there's this sort of idea of this dichotomy, um, and so that has led to the assumption that if we promote genetic explanations or biomedical conceptualizations of mental disorders, we can avoid this kind of moral framework of, of individual fault. Uh, at least that's been the conventional wisdom. And in fact, we do know um, when we look at genetic and other kinds of biomedical explanations for mental disorders that one of their most robust effects in experimental studies and also correlational studies is that they're linked with reduced blame. So when people's mental disorders are thought of as being caused by genetics and other kinds of bi biomedical uh, roots, the person is blamed less for having the disorder. That's a quite robust finding. It's been shown in meta-analysis meta in particular, one published in 2013 actually two meta-analyses. So we know that biomedical explanations, including genetic explanations, can reduce blame. 
Um, but in recent years, it's also been increasingly evident that these kinds of biogenetic explanations can also have downsides, some pretty significant downsides. Um, and the most well-documented negative effect of these explanations is that they can lead to this assumption that if a person has a mental disorder and it's caused by their genes, that means the person is much less likely to ever get better. Um, so I refer to this kind of assumption as prognostic pessimism. I'm talking about pessimistic beliefs about a person's prognosis, their chances of, of um, getting better. And this is, a, as I mentioned, a very uh, well-documented effect of biogenetic explanations for mental disorders. So I've just told you about the two most well-documented effects of these kinds of explanations. They lead people with mental disorders to be perceived as less blameworthy on the one hand, but on the other hand, as much less likely to ever get better. What I haven't told you is what happens when people think their own symptoms are caused by genetic and other kinds of biological factors. And that's where the first study I'm going to talk about uh, comes in. So um, when we uh, think about how people's causal beliefs about where their symptoms come from um, and how that might relate to their expectations about their own prognoses, it's actually a pretty important question clinically. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm interested in the impact that these kinds of beliefs have on patients. And we know, um, for example, in depression, when patients are more pessimistic about ever getting better, uh, this can cause them, lead them to be less engaged in treatment, and they actually experience less symptom reduction over the course of treatment, so they benefit less from treatment. Um, this is based on data from um, the NIMH treatment of depression studies. So uh, th these kinds of negative prognostic beliefs, at least in the case of depression, can become a self-fulfilling prophecy where um, thinking you're less likely to get better can actually lead you to actually be less likely to get better. So the first study I'm going to talk about uh, looked at this question of whether people who adopt uh, biogenetic explanations for their own symptoms are more pessimistic about their chances of, of getting better. And to try to answer this question, um, we did a study of depressed people and looked at the relationship between their, um, their belief in biogenetic explanations and their expectancies about their own chances of getting better. So we did this study online of people who scored at least a score of 16 on a measure called the Beck Depression Inventory, uh, which is a well-validated, widely used measure of depression symptoms. Um, so scores of 16 or higher uh, are a pretty clear indication that the person has something more than a very minimal level of depressive symptoms. Uh, we measured these people's beliefs about the causes of their own depressive symptoms, so we asked them to rate how uh, much of a role each of a series of different types of causal factors played in, in bringing about their symptoms, and in particular, we asked them uh, how much a role they ascribe to genetics and brain, chemi brain chemistry. Uh, and in this study, we averaged these two responses together. Um, they held together very tightly statistically, uh, and so that was the justification for averaging them. Then we measured people's ex expectations about their own prognosis. So we asked them, how long do you think you'll continue to feel sad, blue, or depressed? And they made a rating of their own uh, prognostic expectations. And our hypothesis here was that the more people attribute their own symptoms to biochemical and genetic causes, the longer they would expect those symptoms to last. And this is based on the observation that that seems to be what happens when people make ratings about other people's uh, prognoses. So um, we looked at this, the answer to this question about how long do you think that you'll continue to feel sad, blue, or depressed, and looked, if, looked at whether people's responses to that question would be associated with their uh, ratings of the, the biogenetic causes for their symptoms. And using regression analyses, we found, in fact, that um, this is what happened. So the, the more people attributed their depression to these biochemical and genetic causes, the longer they expected to remain depressed. And you can see an illustration of that in this regression plot. Uh, we also followed this up with a second study where we added the words in your case when we asked people to make these ratings of these causal uh, factors, the, the uh, biochemical and genetic causes of depression, to really emphasize that they were making a rating about the causes of their own symptoms. And when we did that, we got an even stronger effect. So this is really the first empirical demonstration that the more people attribute their symptoms to biogenetic causes, the longer they expect to remain depressed. But looking at these regression plots, there's a little bit of a problem, which is that this, is, these, this finding is just telling us that the people who attribute their symptoms to genetic causes and biochemical causes are the ones who expect to be depressed longer, but it's not telling us that they uh, are pessimistic about their prognoses because of their genetic 
beliefs about their biogenetic beliefs about their symptoms. So um, it could be that people who are already pessimistic about their symptoms just latch on to genetic explanations for whatever reason. So the causality could be going in any direction here. Um, obviously, we all know that correlation doesn't necessarily indicate causation. So one way to solve this problem is to design studies that can experimentally manipulate whether or not people are given a genetic explanation of, of their own, of a mental disorder, rather than just looking at correlations. Um, and the purpose of this is to try to become more sure that the genetic explanation is actually causing the negative effects that we observe. So in some of my recent work, I've developed a technique to um, examine what would happen if we told people that their own symptoms were genetically caused. And this approach is taking advantage of a trend that we're all very familiar with in this room, uh, where these direct-to-consumer genetic testing kits are being marketed directly to the public um, to appeal to their desire to learn about their ancestry and their risk for various different health conditions um, and even what breed their dog belongs to. <laughs> so this has become very widespread, and so we tr we're trying to kind of uh, m mimic this in our study. So in our methodology, um, we made our own testing kits, uh, and though they were fake, they were designed to look credible. Um, and we put together hundreds of these kits and we mailed them to people who we recruited online. So the idea was to kind of simulate this direct-to-consumer testing situation where people were getting the kits um, and just doing, using them in their own privacy of their own home. And so when people received these kits, they were told that they would undergo a biochemical test of their saliva and that, that this would determine whether or not they carried a genetic predisposition to major depression. So this is what the testing kit looked like when participants opened it. Uh, it contained two things, this little container of blue liquid, this mouthwash, and then a testing strip. So in reality, the test strip was just a glucose test strip. It was only sensitive to glucose. Um, and the cover story was that this strip would detect people's salivary levels of a chemical called 5-hydroxyindoleacetic acid, which is a metabolite of serotonin, and that based on this, uh, the result would reveal their level of genetic uh, susceptibility to depression. Um, so the way participants used these materials is that they were told to rinse their mouths out with the mouthwash, um, spit it out, then put the test strip under their tongue um, for a few seconds, and then check out what color it changed to. So that little blue tip on the end of the test strip would change colors because unbeknownst to the participants, the mouthwash had glucose in it. So when they put the test strip in their mouths after they rinsed it with, rinsed with the mouthwash, the blue square on the end turned to like a brownish green color. Um, then we asked them all to indicate, okay, what color is it now? And of course they all said brownish green because that was what happened due to the mouthwash. And then we just randomly assigned people to be told either that this brown or green color meant that they did have this genetic predisposition to depression or to be told that they didn't have the genetic predisposition. So the, the feedback was determined completely at random and they all saw the exact same color change. So in our first study using this test method, the saliva test method, um, we used the, the Beck depression inventory, which I mentioned earlier, to identify participants who had uh, at least mild depression starting out. Uh, they had at least mild level of symptoms. And our dependent measure, our outcome variable, was a modified version of the scale called the negative mood regulation scale, um, where higher scores indicate more confidence in one's ability to cope with or, or respond to depressive symptoms. Um, and lower scores indicate less confidence in your ability to, to regulate these depressed moods. So it's kind of a measure of prognostic pessimism or, or even sort of agency or self-efficacy to respond to depression. Um, and what we found is that um, compared to people who were told they didn't have this genetic predisposition, people who were told they did have the genetic predisposition uh, scored significantly lower on this measure of negative mood regulation, uh, perceived negative mood regulation ability. So the, even though the feedback from the so-called genetic test was determined completely at random, people who scored, who, who got feedback telling them they had this genetic predisposition felt less able to uh, effectively deal with symptoms of depression, to cope with those symptoms. And we also had a third condition where uh, these people were also told that they had this genetic predisposition to depression, but they watched a short video, an, in an educational intervention, um, teaching them about basically the idea that genes play only a non-deterministic role in causing depression, that um, genes don't 
deterministically cause people to have depression or not, that genes interact with each other, they interact with the environment, um, there are things that you can do to uh, cope with or respond to depression even if you do have these genes. Um, and among people who got the genetic predisposition feedback but also watched the intervention, we didn't see this increased uh, or decreased scores on the negative mood regulation scale. So we didn't, the, the, the intervention effectively mitigated um, the negative effects of the genetic predisposition feedback. Um, so looking at these data and the, the correlational data I showed you, I think they kind of can start to converge on this idea that um, telling the, the people who believe their symptoms in the case of depression are caused by genes and other biological factors, um, potentially because of some, some essentialist thinking, they uh, see themselves as uh, more likely to have difficulty avoiding depression or overcoming it should it arise in the future. But in some more recent work, I've also looked at the question of whether people might see genetics as so fundamental or essential to their, their self, their self-concept, that telling them they have a genetic predisposition to, to a disorder might actually lead them to recall having experienced more symptoms of that disorder in the past. So for this line of work, I use the Beck depression inventory at, uh, as the dependent variable. So this was the outcome, what, how people would score on this. And because it's a self-report measure of people's experience of depression symptoms, uh, higher scores basically mean people recall having experienced more symptoms of depression. And actually the time frame for the BDI is asking people to reflect on the past two weeks. So uh, the higher you score on this, the higher, the, the more symptoms of depression you recall having experienced over the past two weeks. And of course, lower scores mean the opposite. Um, and so in this study, we uh, again had these three conditions where people were either told they did or didn't have the genetic predisposition, or they were told they did have it, but they watched the intervention video. And what we saw is that compared to the genetic, the people who were told they didn't have this genetic predisposition, the people who were told they did have it scored significantly higher on this measure of depression uh, severity. And of course, you should remember that these this feedback was determined completely at random. So these were people who were just randomly assigned to one group or the other, and the people who were told they the only information they were given was either they were genetically predisposed to depression or they were not based on this very brief saliva test. And yet, based just on that random uh, intervention, the people who were told they didn't have this genetic predisposition were scoring somewhere around an 11 on the BDI, which is uh, not, not, which would be not unexpected from just a randomly sampled general population group. It's not particularly indi indicative of uh, any significant levels of depression, whereas the people who were told they did have a gen genetic predisposition were scoring closer to 16, which is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, d definitively in the range of what you would expect from people who, who are showing uh, notable symptoms of depression. And here we also had an intervention condition where people watched the same video about the non-deterministic role of genes. And in this case, it didn't really seem to help. So the bar on the right may look a little bit lower than the one in the middle, um, but that's not a significant difference. And actually, both of the bars on the right, the two groups who were told they had the genetic predisposition, were scoring significantly higher on the BDI um, than the people who were told they didn't have the genetic predisposition, whether or not they saw the intervention video. Uh, we also followed these findings up with a second experiment, which included an additional condition where people were told that they were genetically uh, predisposed to hypertension or high blood pressure rather than depression, because we thought, you know, maybe this is just a negative mood induction, and people who were told they had this genetic uh, susceptibility uh, were just became sad because of that, and that's why they scored higher on the BDI. So. Um, we added this hypertension condition to look at that, and it seems like that's not really what's happening because people who were told they were genetically predisposed to depression, uh, to hypertension, didn't score any higher on the uh, measure of depression symptoms than the people who were told they lacked a genetic predisposition to depression. But again, the people who were told they did have this genetic predisposition to depression scored significantly higher on the measure of, of recall of depression symptoms. Um, and in this case, this is true again, regardless of whether or not these people have received an intervention. So overall, it seems like this kind of personalized genetic information may be having uh, a pretty profound effect on people um, enough to get them to the point where they're rethinking their past experiences and uh, revising their recall to um, incorporate the assumption that they must have had more experiences of depression given that they have this supposed genetic predisposition.
Okay, so uh, so far in the talk, um, I've been speaking about studies of people who have symptoms of mental disorders, um, but in the next set of studies I'm going to present, um, they deal with the consequences of biogenetic explanations for mental disorders among professional clinicians who treat these patients. So, uh, for instance, I was interested in the question of how biogenetic explanations would affect the empathy that clinicians feel toward patients. And again, clinically, this is a very important issue because we know that empathy among clinicians is, is actually considered to be a bedrock of the, uh, the clinician-patient relationship, which we would call the therapeutic alliance. And actually, we know from meta-analysis meta that um, the more empathy a therapist has for a patient, the better that patient will do in treatment, but the more the patient will benefit from treatment. So um, empathy is very important uh, in treatment of mental disorders. And in thinking about the relationship between biogenetic explanations and empathy, um, I considered three possible hypotheses. So one is that um, genetic, biogenetic explanations would have no effect on empathy among clinicians, and this might actually be the outcome we would hope for. Um, you might, we might like to think that clinicians would be so sophisticated um, and, have, and because of their expertise in mental disorders, they would not be easily swayed by biogenetic information. So that seemed plausible. Another possibility was that the biogenetic explanations would lead to increased empathy, uh, and the proposed mechanism for that would be a reduction in blame. So I talked earlier about how genetic explanations can reduce the extent to which people are blamed for their symptoms, and um, blame and empathy typically in the literature have an inverse relationship. So something that reduces blame might be expected to increase empathy. Uh, you sympathize more with someone if they're not to blame for their own plight. But we also thought it was possible that um, biogenetic explanations would lead to decreased empathy, and the, the possible mechanism for this might be a sort of uh, dehumanization. So, so this idea that um, people are, if you emphasize the ways in which people are genetically different from so-called normal people, uh, maybe that makes them harder to empathize with because they're seen as more different. So um, these are all, these all seem plausible. Um, and so to test the possibilities, we conducted uh, studies among mental health clinicians in the United States. So our samples included both psychiatrists and non-medical treatment providers. And the clinicians participating in these studies read a series of vignettes describing different patients with different mental disorders. And for each disorder, they would read two vignettes. So there would be two patients per disorder. Uh, so, for example, one of the disorders we used was social phobia. So every clinician who read about social phobia read about two patients who had, who were described as having symptoms that would meet criteria for social anxiety disorder, social phobia. Uh, one is Michelle, a 21-year-old college student. The other one is Nicole, who's a 22-year-old who uh, becomes extremely anxious around strangers. And then. Um, for each vignette, uh, each vignette would be paired with an explanatory passage uh, giving a possible explanation for the person's symptoms. So one of the vignettes would be paired with a biogenetic explanation that focused on um, hereditary and other kinds of biological potential explanations for why the person has these symptoms. And the other would be so accompanied by more psychosocial explanations that focus on aspects of the person's life history that might explain why they have this, these symptoms. And importantly, these pairings of which vignette was accompanied by which explanation were uh, completely counterbalanced. So um, the, the idiosyncrasies of the vignettes, the descriptions of the characteristics of the patients could not account for any differences that we observed in empathy between uh, cases where the biogenetic explanation was present and cases where the psychosocial explanation was present. And after uh, these clinicians read each vignette explanation pair, they uh, rated how much each of a series of adjectives described their feelings regarding the person in, uh, in the vignette. And six of these were sympathetic, soft-hearted, warm, compassionate, tender, and moved, uh, which form a scale that's been used pretty extensively for some time um, to measure empathy, or what's sometimes called empathic concern in the social psychology literature. So we analyzed the data from these clinicians to see how these biogenetic explanations would affect their empathy compared to the psychosocial explanations. And um, to start with, I'll show the data from the social phobia example that I talked about a moment ago. And so we found in this case that compared to the psychosocial explanation, um, which are represented by the purple bars, the biogenetic explanation yielded significantly less empathy. Um, we also looked at three other disorders um, because 
prior research has shown that uh, different disorders are seen as biologically caused to different extents by clinicians. So clinicians think of something like social phobia or social anxiety disorder as a highly non-biological disorder, but clinicians tend to think of something like schizophrenia as a highly biological disorder. And then the other two disorders we looked at were somewhere in the middle. So depression and obsessive compulsive disorder are seen somewhere in the, toward the middle of that conceptual continuum from the disorder seen as highly biological to those seen as highly non-biological. But what we found is that even though these are all very different disorders, um, the, in all cases, the biomedical explanation yielded significantly lo lower empathy scores from the clinicians than the uh, psychosocial explanations did. And these are medium to large effect sizes. Okay, so now I've talked about studies of people who have uh, symptoms of mental disorders and studies of mental health clinicians. Um, and just in the last uh, set of studies I'm gonna talk about, uh, the last data are uh, from a more recent study that looked at how genetic explanations affect how members of the general public uh, perceive, perceive patients. Uh, and this study I'm going to talk about focused on addiction, and part of the reason I thought addiction would be an interesting, an interesting context in which to examine the effects of, bio, of, of genetic explanations is that portraying addiction as a, as a biomedical disease, perhaps one with genetic roots, has for a pretty long time um, been seen sort of in the conventional wisdom as a way of reducing the tendency that's very widespread to stigmatize people with addictions as, as just choosing to engage in a very problematic, uh, socially unacceptable behavior or as a moral failing. Uh, and you can sort of see that in this headline, which is referring to a, a US uh, Surgeon General's report from a few years ago. And the, the headline says, addiction is an illness, not a moral failing, says Surgeon General. So again, you can see that kind of dichotomization between uh, an illness or a moral failing. If so, if it's one, it can't be the other. So if it's so, a great way to, according to this logic, a great way to make people stop blaming people for their addictions and and thinking of them as having a moral failing is to is to play up the idea that addiction is an illness, and perhaps one with biological or and and especially genetic causes. And we do know, in fact, that addictions are highly stigmatized. So even compared to other mental disorders. Um, addictions are very highly stigmatized and more so than with other disorders, blame is a very prominent part, component of the stigma of, of addiction. So people with addictions are blamed for their problems much more so even than people with other mental disorders. Uh, and so then given what I said earlier about how blame can be reduced by genetic explanations, um, perhaps addictions would be a context in, in which genetic explanations would be particularly well suited to have positive effects. That, that's one, one hypothesis and one that's been stated in the literature that even if biogenetic explanations have negative effects in other cases, surely for addiction uh, they, they will be helpful. But this has also been controversial, this idea of, of emphasizing uh, the role of biology and, and genetics and other biological factors in, in addiction, um, in part because of this concern that that genetic explanations for addiction, uh, portraying or um, talking about addiction as being completely determined by genes might sort of rob people of agency. It, it might lead to this assumption that people are being governed by factors that are completely outside of their control, um, they're totally helpless, um, and there's nothing they can do about their behavior, and that could be problematic, it may be stigmatizing or dehumanizing to talk about people as lacking agency in this way. Um, and it, particularly in the case of addiction, um, if you think about what were these kinds of beliefs to emerge among patients and clinicians, it would be particularly problematic because we know that, um, that a sense of agency and self-efficacy is really important for recovery from addiction. So if people are endorsing genetic explanations and that's leading to the idea that there's no self-control or no agency involved, um, it could be clinically contraindicated. Okay, so in this study, um, the question is, when we look at genetic explanations for addiction, do we see this benefit in terms of blame? So are people gonna be blamed less for having the addiction? Um, and also, 
if this, if we do see a reduction in blame, is this accompanied by a negative effect where people will be seen as having less agency? Um, and in this study, uh, I also looked at whether the pattern of results might differ depending on uh, whether the addiction in question is a substance addiction or a behavioral addiction, which is a term that just refers to an addiction that is that doesn't involve a substance. So in this study, uh, I used alcohol use disorder, which is the most common addictive disorder, as the example for a substance addiction and gambling disorder as the example for a behavioral addiction. Um, this is the, gambling disorder is the first behavioral addiction to be formally recognized in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders as a recognized uh, mental disorder. Um, okay, so uh, in this study, uh, we recruited uh, U.S. adults online and had them read about an adult man named Charlie who is random, who they were randomly assigned to either read about a version of Charlie who had alcohol use disorder or a version of Charlie who had gambling disorder. Um, and they also were randomly assigned to either receive a genetic explanation of Charlie's problem where they were told that it was caused by his DNA or a non-genetic explanation where they were told that instead it was caused by environmental factors. And then they completed ratings of how much blame and agency they ascribed to this person. So our measure of blame was to what extent do you believe Charlie is to blame for his problem? And for agency, we asked people to rate their agreement with three statements. There are things Charlie can do to overcome his problem. Charlie has the ability to get better. And Charlie has control over his problem. Now it turned out that the, those first two items loaded onto one factor um, when we when we looked at them statistically, um, and the third item didn't load onto that same factor, so we analyzed that item separately as a, as a measure of self-control, which you can see is conceptually a little bit different. Um, so just to give a general overview of the results, uh, we analyzed these data using a, a two by two disorder by explanation ANOVA. Um, there were no significant interactions, so uh, we collapsed across the two disorders when looking at the effects of of uh, genetic versus non-genetic explanation. There are also no significant main effects of disorder. Um, so blame, agency, and self-control ratings were not different between the two disorders, but there was a significant main effect of, of explanation, so genetic versus non-genetic explanation on these uh, dependent variables. Um, so for blame, what we saw is that, as you might expect, compared to the non-genetic explanation, the genetic explanation evokes significantly less blame. Um, but the uh, going accompanying that, there was this effect where the genetic explanation also yielded significantly lower ratings of agency ascribed to this person, and also less self-control. So then the question becomes, are genetic explanations for addiction a double-edged sword? So are these uh, explanations reducing blame, which is a great goal and, a, and a, a, an outcome that I think we would all be in favor of, by portraying people with addictions as helpless, which could, as I mentioned earlier, might be problematic. Um, so specifically, um, if these explanations are promoting the idea that people with addictions have no self-control and no agency, it could be stigmatizing. And if these effects are found among clinicians and patients as, as well, that could not be clinically harmful because um, it's important for both clinicians and patients to believe that the patient can get better and has the self-efficacy to overcome the addiction in order for treatment to be successful. And so that's something that I'm hoping to look at in a future study. Okay, so that's the last of my data that I'm going to present. Uh, so I'd just like to take a moment to just briefly review the main conclusions. So first, when we looked at what happens when symptomatic people view their own psychological problems through a biomedical lens, and particularly a genetic lens, um, we saw that this led them to endorse more pessimistic prognostic expectations, um, and that it can even lead people to, uh, it can even seems to potentially alter uh, people's recall of their experience of symptoms. Um, we saw that an educational intervention can teach people about how genes play only a non-deterministic role in depression, uh, and that this can help with the negative effect on prognostic pessimism, although it doesn't seem to help with the uh, seemingly uh, distorted memory that we observed. Um, we also saw that compared to psychosocial explanations, these biogenetic explanations uh, seem to lead providers, treatment providers, to feel less empathy for patients. And um, that although genetic explanations can uh, reduce blame, this, can, uh, this seems to be accompanied by um, reduced uh, perceptions of self-efficacy and agency.
Okay, so I will stop there. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Sure. Yeah. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Two questions. One is about time. I'm wondering how much after you gave the in the first set of studies after you gave the quote genetic test result you looked at their recall. And as part of that, too, uh, I'm concerned that a lot of studies sort of look at an immediate effect of here's genetic testing, mm -hmm. what's the effect on your view, versus over time, how long that lasts. Right. And a second question would be, on the study of, M of uh, physicians and other providers, I'm wondering if there are any differences in empathy between male and female providers or MDs, non-MDs, for instance. Yeah, great questions. So um, for your first question about how long after the uh, saliva test, people's memories seem to be distorted. Um, th it was immediate, so um, this is an, an immediate effect. With these studies, particularly the studies where we uh, experimentally manipulated people's beliefs about the causes of their s symptoms, uh, it would be impossible to get ethical approval to have, the, to have a, a delay between um, people getting the fake DNA test results and uh, measuring the R dependent variables. So uh, they, we had to do it in, in rapid succession where people uh, got the test result, they answered the questions, and they were immediately debriefed using a very quite com unusually comprehensive debriefing procedure. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, that I, th I think that's one of the confusing things about the literature is that um, if you're going to do an experimental study where you actually use random assignment to separate out the effects of the genetic of the genetic test result, the genetic feedback itself from the effects of the disorder itself or the effects of actual genetic differences between the people which are canceled out presumably by using random assignment, then you have to do it. You can, you can only really do it as in a very short term study because ethically you can't prolong the deception more than a few minutes. Um, so on the one hand, that's you could see that as a limitation of this kind of research. On the other hand, it overcomes some of the limitations of other work that uh, look, tries to look at the effects of genetic uh, information by comparing, let's say, carriers to non-carriers, but there may be all kinds of differences between those two groups besides just what information they got from their test. It could be that one group, they, well, first of all, there are known genetic differences between the two groups, which is a, a potential compound, especially with something like depression. Um, there, there may be differences in family history between those, the carriers and non-carriers that could account for the results. So there could be all kinds of compounds that uh, I felt like we really needed experimental data to overcome, but then one of the limitations is the duration issue. Um, then to your second question about uh, demographic effects, um, I don't believe there was an empathy effect. Uh, I mean, uh, I, well, actually, I, I can't remember if there was a gender effect on empathy. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was. And there are a number of studies I find that on these measures of empathy, women do tend to score higher. Um, I, I'm not actually even sure if we met, looked at that because that wasn't part of our hypothesis. We did look at differences between MDs and non-MDs. What we found was just a main effect where MDs scored lower on measures of empathy across the board. Uh, it didn't interact with what kind of information we gave them. So nothing we did made any difference. It didn't interact with that. It was just a, a significant main effect in pretty much every study where the MDs had significantly lower uh, measure, lower scores on the empathy measure. And I mean, like, a, a generous way for me to interpret that to, as being in line with my hypothesis is that these people have more, much more biomedically oriented training, so maybe that's why. Um, but it, it could also be other differences in the training. I mean, as a psychologist, I think the, in our training, the approach to empathy that's given that what we're taught is very different from what uh, physicians are taught. Um, so yeah, that, that, was the, that was the main sort of demographic type difference that we observed in empathy. God, I'm so depressed about that. <laughs> yeah, not surprised, but depressed. Um, so, so those were very cool experiments. I, I, uh, I think that I was really intrigued by your intervention that partially ameliorated, or at least in the one case, mm -hmm. right, ameliorated um, the the ill effect. Um, and it makes me think about our um, what we've struggled with for a long time in genetics, and it's this feeling that that genetics is because we can't change our genes, um, that it's somehow hopeless, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think your 
that intervention was a really good part of that study because it shows that it isn't. And, and actually, if we think about it, we know that we're very used to certain situations that are highly, highly genetic and yet not associated with any hopelessness at all if things are actionable. So for example, a huge proportion of people in this room have a genetically um, determined major disability that is no longer a major disability because right. we can wear eyeglasses, right. right? But you know, not that many generations ago, that would have been a big deal. Yeah. And, and so I hope that as we slowly, inevitably slowly develop more treatments for things, as things become more actionable, that some of that bias will disappear. So I had one question for you. Um, and that is, this seems to me like a good case since you did have such a compelling experimental setup that I would have loved to have checked back with those people later and make sure they didn't retain any of that really convincing, you know, you're more, more inclined to depression. Did you do anything? Like that? Yeah, well, so we didn't did look I, did back. I that? No, I, this is a slide that I didn't present, uh, but we didn't look back with people after the fact, but what we did do was, um, during the debriefing, we had people answer true-false questions after they read it to make sure that they understood it. Um, and so they had to get all the questions right in order yeah. to complete the study. And that's good, but I worry, you know, that, that it's, I mean, going way back to the Milgram experiments, yeah. right? People in authority who tell you something, I just wonder how erasable that is, right? It'd be... Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah it, it's... It, it's true. I mean, we we tried to do our best to ensure that people wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be leaving the study thinking that they had learned something about their DNA, uh, and that this was the the best way we could come up with to do it. Um, and because this is this is an online study and it's anonymous, partially to uh, because of ethical reasons and, and IRB reasons, we can't recontact the people later to follow up with them, but. Um, but um, according to their answers to the, the debriefing quiz, the comprehension quiz, they all should have understood that it was that they, there was no real DNA testing. Yeah, so on that, could you maybe walk us through the, the debriefing component and were they advised that there's sort of treatment available that if they are depressed that yeah. there's medical intervention? Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so even in, in much more innocuous studies, um, any study we do um, that's measuring symptoms of, of any psychiatric disorder, the debriefing always includes information about treatment being available and links to, these are online studies, so um, links to help people find it, uh, crisis hotlines and all that information. And, and one of the things that was unique about this study was that the debriefing was much more extensive, contained a lot more information and sort of reiterated many different times and using many different kinds of wording that your your tissues and cells were never tested for any sort of genetic predisposition to any mental disorder or other health condition during this study. Um, you, the saliva test was completely fake. Uh, and there, these things are reiterated at different points throughout the debriefing in different fonts, some in all capitals, some highlighted, some in black text on a white background. Um, so it, it, then there, there was also, um, let, let me try to think what else. So um, th there was not in all of the studies, but in in most of them there, uh, and I, when I say not all the studies, I just mean we didn't we came up with it after we had already started doing it. But uh, we started including an, so, in something called a process debriefing, which is uh, shown in the psychology literature to help with this effect where you can't where debriefing sometimes don't take. Uh, and the way that works, the process debriefing, the way that works is that you actually explain to people this phenomenon where sometimes people do these studies and they get fake information and then they get a debriefing that tells them it was fake and they like think that they understand it, but it actually continues to affect them because they really still believe it. But make, like, make sure that you don't do that. Be vigilant about that. <laughs> and it sounds really kind of lame, but actually the, the, there's a, a, a quite a good deal of research on that at this point that shows that that actually really does make a difference and that that usually wipes out that uh, that holdover effect where people hold on to the fake information. So we did that too. Um, as it says on this slide, um, we obviously we minimize the duration of the deception because that makes people less likely to hold on to it. Um, 
we didn't selectively recruit vulnerable populations. So the advertising didn't mention anything about depression or genetic testing. Um, we didn't recruit college students or, or any which are considered a vulnerable population in the IRB world. Uh, so because they're particularly susceptible to coercion. Um, so we, we worked very closely with our IRB to set the study up. Um, we said in the consent that hold on till the end of the study because you're going to get more information about that because uh, you can't include deceptive information in the consent. So you can't say, you know, you're going to get genetic testing, but you can say you're going to do some stuff and we're going to tell you more about it later, which is basically what we did. Um, and obviously we monitored for adverse event uh, reporting and we didn't get any of that. So we think we did our best to avoid it. I mean, um, it's always theoretically possible that someone could have been harmed by it, but to our knowledge that well, I'm we glad really you have a slide, that. a very necessary slide. Thank you. Yep. Hi, nice talk. Thanks. And um, I have a question about the study where you were looking at recall mm -hmm. um, with the you know testing intervention. And I guess I want to push back a little bit, at least with the results, in that what you could interpret it as being is that for folks who learned they're at risk, they then recalled more supportive evidence that confirmed that risk, right? So sort of mm -hmm. going along with the heuristics we know exist in terms of co confirmation bias and recall bias. Right. So I wondered if you've at all thought about integrating an additional condition where perhaps, it'd be a lot harder to do and I'm not exactly sure how you do it, but if you could include some sort of little survey that would, you would then be able to give feedback and say you're at increased risk because of social factors mm -hmm. or you're at increased risk because of environmental factors. And then you'd be able to see if these effects are uniquely strong because of the biogenetic piece of the results or is it simply, you know, this, this idea that you're learning, you're at risk and then recalling more examples of how you have in fact behaved or experienced things that are consistent with that elevated risk. Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. Um, and I uh, I think it, it is a study you could do. Um, there may be some things about it that would be a little bit harder to pull off, mm. um, just because I think the manipulation here is very potent. Uh, and it'd be hard to match that with a, a environmental uh, information. So I can tell you uh, a couple of things. Well, one a thought about uh, what if that's if that is what you suggested about hindsight bias if that is what's happening what does that mean is one thing and then another thing is why didn't why did we focus on genetic explanation instead of other kinds of explanation so for the first issue um you know things like the Beck depression inventory are validated using our current diagnostic system which relies on self-reported recall of symptoms to make almost every psychiatric diagnosis so that's how we diagnose mental disorders I'm, I hope I'm not letting a cat out of the bag uh, <laughs> we ask people questions about what they recall having experienced and then based on what they say we, we either give them a diagnosis or we don't um, and so if getting a result of a genetic test alters people's answers to those questions, whether it's whether that means that they're just more accurately recalling th experiences they really did have versus it's they're making stuff up or the, the I think that uh, that's almost I think of it almost as being kind of beside the point because we know that if you ask people these questions without giving them the test, they give one set of answers and that's what the diagnosis, the diagnostic criteria are based on and that's the what something like the BDI is validated against. Um, but if you give them the genetic information first, they give a different answer. So I think that's notable regardless of what the psychological mechanism is. And I think you're definitely right that part of it could be like, well, now I'm going to think of every, like those things that happened where I did feel kind of down are going to seem like a bigger deal to me than they did before I got this feedback. I think that's most likely is the explanation. Um, then as for your question about whether it's unique to biological, like personalized biological or genetic feedback as opposed to other kinds of personalized feedback, uh, I think it's very possible that um, that if you told people you're at increased risk because of your childhood experiences, maybe they would show the same kind of distortion of recall. Mm -hmm. 
the difference that I th see is that there is actually a push happening in healthcare to have people get more personalized genetic information and to use that more in healthcare. And there is no such corresponding push to incorporate more information about people's psychosocial histories. And I wish there were because that would be very, very, that's actually the thing that we know actually does cause depression uh, is, is life experiences. Um, again, I hope that's not a, a surprise to anyone in the room. Um, but uh, we, we, that we're not seeing that. So what we're interested, you know, I said I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm interested in what's going to happen to people in the real world. And I think uh, this is trying to simulate a scenario that might actually be happening. Um, and I unfortunately don't think the alternative one that you proposed is likely to happen, although I kind of wish it would. Um, so Thank yeah, you. no problem. Yeah, thanks. That's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask you. I, I, I wanted to push you on what you see as the societal implications of this type of research, both for health care and for science policy. And I have a couple to throw out and see what you think about them, mm -hmm. and then you may have others. So um, with regard to health care, when you showed sort of the combined um, that it may reduce blame, but also reduce a uh, sense of agency, both within the patient and as perceived by their clinicians. I was instantly thinking about Eric Perrin's work on binocularity. So these things are not actually inconsistent. Right. Um, in fact, good clinicians would use the genetic information. I know the genetic information isn't strong enough yet, but as, let's assume it's getting stronger over time. They would use biological information anyway. Um, to actually say, therefore, it's, you know, I want to give you, be especially attentive to giving you extra ways to uh, enhance your agency to deal with mm -hmm. what is more of a barrier for you. So these are these are these could be combined in very powerful supportive healing narratives. So that's one implication, perhaps, where the audience for that message would be clinicians and healthcare policy people. And then on the science policy side, you've just you just brought it up and to me this is the elephant in the room I mean if this is really true and it gets enhanced not only in mental health arenas but you start to do this in physical health it absolutely undermines the entire premise of precision medicine so what responsibilities do researchers doing this kind of work have to connect those dots and and also what other societal implications do you see of this this vein of research yeah, um, so those are great points. Um, so let's see. Uh, your first question about sort of how do uh, how does how do blame and self-efficacy actually play out in a, in a clinical encounter or in treatment? And uh, so I, um, I don't know that I have the answer to that. Um, I think there is a real there may actually be a real tension between this idea of how do we not necessarily a tension between two things, but there may be a tension inherent in this idea, in this question of how do we uh, get away from blame and stigma, but also maintain self-efficacy and the ability to change. And I think you made a really good point that if someone uh, does have particular predispositions, maybe that we could just sort of conceptualize that as a, a reason for them to need extra support and skills to, to sort of overcome those predispositions and maintain their agency. And, um, and I think that's actually a lot of the focus of a lot of the um, what are referred to often as as evidence-based treatments for mental disorders. People disagree about whether that's appropriate terminology, but I'm I'm trained primarily in the cognitive behavioral tradition, um, things like cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy are our approaches where uh, the focus is very much on helping people capitalize on their strengths and their their agency, their self-efficacy, what can you do now to uh, make things better for yourself? What is within your power to to do? So it's about empowering the patient, which I think is a really important goal, and it becomes even more important if it's happening in the face of, of this tidal wave of, uh, of ideas that could potentially be disempowering, like everything's genetically predetermined. Um, so it's not so much that these approaches start from the point of, well, it is biologically determined and therefore we're going to give you more empowering skills to help you, but um, it, it is 
it's more starting from the starting point of okay, we're kind of agnostic about where these things come from in the first place, but we are, so we're just going to focus on empowering you to do something about it now. But maybe that is true that that becomes even more important when it's uh, coming up against like uh, forces that are uh, operating in the opposite direction. Uh, as for science policy, um, I think that's a really great point. Um, you know, I've I've tried to present these results at different in different uh, forums. Um, presenting it here, I presented it at psychology conferences. Uh, my my PhD advisor presented a lot of this work at the LC Congress, and um, people in the audience asked questions about you know. But I thought we did the study, and it turns out genetic determinism isn't really a problem. So what are you even talking about? So there is a kind of a, a that, that that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But you know there there are there is like a whole there is a disconnect, which is I think part of what the idea behind this conference having this, this meeting was to sort of have people talk about what really is going on and uh, what can we do about it if there really are negative effects. Um, you know, it's interesting, we published some of this work in, uh, most of it in psychology journals. Um, the clinician study was published in PNAS. Um, one of the genetic testing studies was published in Journal of Genetic Counseling. So, I mean, we're trying to kind of get the word out there. Interestingly, we had a lot of trouble publishing any of this in medical journals. Um, people seem to be very, very resistant uh, in cases where we could even get it reviewed. We got some of the most like vitriolic reviews back on mm -hmm. some of these studies that I've ever seen. And psychologists are not gentle in their reviews. So, I, but I was still kind of uh, taken aback by it a little bit. Um, and you know, people couch it in terms of you know they're outraged about this or that methodological problem. But you have to wonder. W where is the resistance coming from? And I don't know that I have an answer about what the best way to overcome some of the resistance is, but um, I just thought that was an interesting observation um, just in the course of trying to get some of this, some of these findings out there. I have some so, suggestions. I'll talk to you offline. Okay, great. I would love that. Just a short question. Yeah. I may have missed it. Great talk. Thanks. For the empathy in, in physicians and, and psychologists, have you tried also the intervention part? So, in the studies that I presented here, uh, we didn't have so we had we we didn't have an intervention per se. Um, we had so we did have a third experiment um, where we tried to combine biomedical and psychosocial information in the uh, information we gave people, and we still got an effect where where when there was predominantly when there was more biological information than psychosocial, there was less empathy than the other way around. It's not really an intervention, but it was trying to look at like. Is there a way we can combine the information and get and minimize the effect? And it wasn't that promising. Um, we did have another study um, where we and let me just see if I can find it. Um, uh, no. Oh wait, sorry. Um, I have a lot of extra slides in here. I try to anticipate every question someone could ask, but. Um, <laughs> I don't know. And I'm, I'm used to using a Mac, so it's like a lot harder to find. This. Okay, never mind. Um, no, but we so we did. I don't have a slide on, but we did do another study where we tried to look at ways of um, of enhancing clinician empathy in the face of biological explanation. So this is a paper that was published, I believe, in 2016. In, it may have been 2017, but I think it's 2016 in uh, Stigma and Health, um, where we gave clinicians. Uh, two different vignettes describing a patient and both had biological explanations, but um, in some cases we added a little intervention, not the same as the one that we used with the patients, but where we basically just changed the wording in very subtle ways to, to try to humanize the person, uh, so to try to combat any dehumanization that might be happening or mechanization that might happen with the biological explanations we put in. Uh, we used an appro approaches that uh, we got from other literature on dehumanization in medicine. So. In particular, the strategies we use are called uh, personification and agency reorientation. So, personification is basically drawing attention to the to the personhood of the individual patient, and agency reorientation is focusing on the per, drawing attention to the patient's ability to make choices and decisions. And we thought these things might help restore some of the empathy that you might lose with a biological explanation. Um, and so, what we found with that was that it didn't actually make a difference with empathy. It didn't. Um, it didn't yield any more empathy from the clinicians. 
but it did uh, reduce their stigmatizing attitude, so their desire for social distance from the person. So that may be um, something, like an area that could merit more research, or, but I think it needs more thought about what is the right way to intervene with clinicians to uh, prevent these biological explanations from, from interfering with empathy. I'm just wondering if the same kind of education intervention to use for the patient would be useful also for the physicians and the psychiatrists or psychologists who basically know the same as your general population about genetics. Yeah. It, so right. the same intervention telling them that, well, the effect size and the role of genetic is very limited. Right. Maybe they need a reminder. Yeah. I think that's that could, that could potentially be helpful. I mean, the intervention we use is more focused on promoting the patient's agency, so things like, you know, even if you have a gene, this gene, there are still things you can do um, to help overcome the, the symptoms and the disorder. So I don't know if exactly that same intervention would be targeted in the right way, but we, but it might. I mean, we've used other sort of related educational modules to teach people about, um, about you know, agency and self-efficacy. Uh, with lay people who are not selected for symptomatology, and it's kind of we've gotten sort of mixed results. So, um, and I'd have to think back to exactly what we found with like agency ratings, but um, I think it's something that needs more thought and more research than what's out there. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Do you just want to go? Go ahead.